Hey, Dockery. Hello. How you doing? I can't hear you. How you doing? I am good. How are you? Pretty good. Is it just me? Yep. Oh. <laughs> well, well, I guess we'll give some people some time. That's for sure. We'll see what happens. How's it hanging? How's your day? It was good. It was relaxing. Um, I um, oh, I uh, just tried out my new Cousinart um teapot. Okay. It was uh, it's pretty nice. It's nice having a teapot. Well, that's fun. Yeah. Uh, and for some reason, my hot chocolate tastes better using the teapot. All right, then. Yep. I guess uh, it's the little things, right? It really is, I guess. How it's prepared goes a long way. I guess that can go in line with uh, how we prepare our hearts for Christ and God. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, hoping more people are. Uh... Yeah, I am too. Otherwise, well, I know Paul isn't coming. I saw his message on group me. Yeah, I saw that. So, you know. Mm hmm. But hey, um, mm. yeah, so I'm just chilling, going over my notes with some fish food beer. All right, well, you know, I hope you're enjoying it. I really am. It's, uh, it's been a while. Alright, sounds like someone else. Hey, Mackenzie. Hey, what's up? It's Kendall. I'm not <laughs> here. I'm just, I'm just poking fun at you, man, because your wife's oh, name is on that. Wait, what am I doing? Is that right? Well, you know. You should probably change your name, right? You don't care. Zach, why can't we see your face? Uh, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't do anything different. Well, did you turn your video off? No. Interesting. Hello. Hey, how you hey, doing, Papa Richard. Tucker? Good, Forrest. Hi, Kendall. Hey. Welcome to St. Louis. Yeah. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah. Um, you got a haircut just now, literally, but, um, yeah, I have a lot less hair than when you knew me. <laughs> <laughs> You've always had short hair. Yeah. In this light, it looks like you have none. Does it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> right. yeah, the hair is uh, receding a little bit. Uh, it looks good on you. That's a, yeah. It'd be bad if you had a weird shaped head, but you have Thank a good shaped head. Yeah. Okay. It'd be bad if I had a weird shaped head. Thank you for pointing that out because I do have a weird shaped head. <laughs> do you have a weird shaped head? It looks normal to me. Oh. I have some people say I look like a, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Interesting. Huh? Interesting. I think you look like Forrest. Hey Nathan, you're a good-looking good guy. Yeah, God. Hey Nate, thank you. Hi Nate. Hey. Hey Nate, I'm Kendall. I'm not Mackenzie. Uh, glad you clarified that. Well, on the thing it says Mackenzie, so. 
What is what? mindset? What? Uh, it says Patrick Tucker. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. I can't change it. Does Google not let me change it? I don't know. I, you said you're on her computer, so it's probably it's just logged into her like Google account. Yeah. Yeah. That's why. Kind of saw it. I was worried that I was going to be late to this, but nope, you're on so time. I ordered the book a, a week and a half ago. Nice. And uh, I still don't have it, but Zachary sent me a number of pages. Yes, I took pictures and sent it to him. <laughs> I'm assuming those are the pages that uh, that are going to be relevant today. Ooh. Yes, it would. It would be those pages, the first two chapters. <laughs> Didn't seem like it was two chapters. They're short. The second chapter is like two pages. It was uh-huh. like. Well, we kind of said we'd do two chapters. So last week to fill uh, uh, you and Kendall in, we said we'd do two chapters to kind of, and see how that goes. Like, is it the right amount? Is it too much? And then we can reassess. And then we also introduced ourselves, what we were hoping to get out of this book, uh, and set our theme scripture, which, you know, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up because the purpose of this is not to just increase in knowledge or gain some little tidbit of information, but to really uh, learn from it and, you know, how can you apply it moving forward, whether it be to your own life or how you uh, interact with the world around you. Cool. And then, of course, set some ground rules as far as like, hey, again, with the, with the whole theme of love building up, this isn't uh, your time to, I don't know, go on a 10-minute exposition, but it's, it's, it's more about simulating discussion and learning from each other. Cool. I can see you now, so that's good, too. Yes. Well, that time I went away because I needed to uh, adjust my mop. Yes, that's my mop. I have a ro- I have a robot mop, and it, I oh, needed, cool. yeah, it it the the tank was empty. Mm. So you know, I'm currently cleaning the kitchen. I love doing that. Yeah, yeah. This house won't let me do it, but in the last house, you know, just leave and push the vacuum and come back, and my whole house was cleaned. It was great. It's it's, it's very nice, especially when you have a lab that sheds everywhere so uh, let's see Mo said he couldn't make it I saw Paul's text in the group he said he couldn't make it um, um, Mike will be here in about a minute or so okay or so we can wait like for that. Mike and then we can pray and then I guess dig right in cool um, right I will also probably be needing to jump off in a second. We uh, <laughs> really a dog, and uh, we found out that our limb that is in between our house and our neighbors uh, busted off with the wind and just hanging oh, there with another tree. So, what is it? So the limb to one of our trees that is in between our house and our neighbors busted and it's just hanging there. Uh, and could possibly fall in the neighbor's house. So we need to figure out what to do with that list. So Obviously. I have a buddy coming over who does tree stuff, and I think we are maybe going to try to have a rope that's tied so that it can maybe pull it the way we want it to fall if it does fall. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do, but. That makes some sense. Right. Yeah, that's tricky. Just make sure you use more than one rope. (laughs) Yeah, we'll see. It's a pretty big limb. I, yeah, I'm just trying to have something in place because tomorrow we'll we'll call it surface and see if they can come out. But there's not really anything you do on this. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. 
let's hope or, you know, hope and pray for you that uh, it doesn't land on a house and destroy things. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the thing I'm probably most, luckily the way it's already kind of leaning, I think that most likely scenario is the neighbor spends up and I have to give, you know, so I have a couple dollars. <laughs> to fix the fence. But yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that's better than destroying the roof or something. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping doesn't happen. That or a window. It bouncing off the ground and hitting a window. Would be... <laughs> Windows are ridiculously expensive. It's crazy. Yeah. So that's what I'm hoping wouldn't happen. But the roof is not as there are certain things about owning a home that I just don't like. Especially <laughs> when you're on the leisure walk right before your book club, you look up and you're like, oh, that's not good. Seeing yeah. as Patrick has owned a home for a very long time, he must be cracking up inside by that comment. <laughs> Adulting. <laughs> Hashtag. Yeah. How very, what, what a relevant word, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Are you still going to say but, but I agree. It's 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 no fun because you get no value out of doing that. I mean, it's not like, gosh, I'm applying this to go on vacation. But, but, but no, you're spending your money to pull a limb off a tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Patrick, are you still in the same house? What's that? Are you still in the same house? As 20 years ago? Well, um, right, we've been here about 20 years. So this yeah. is a story, white brick. And I'm not sure when you moved, but. Oh, four. We used to have a ranch. Okay. In the same neighborhood. In the um, same neighborhood. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't go very far. Yeah. Is that Mike? Remember, describe. But I moved in 04, so it sounds like you've been here. You've been there when I, that whole time. Yeah, I think so. Because McKenna was only like a year old mm -hmm. when y'all when we moved, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and there's Mike. Hi, Mike. Do you want to pray for us? Wow, that's an intro. <laughs> Now, do you guys see yourselves on screen? Mm -hmm. If you go to the top right and you click on the um, four squares, it'll show you top right your picture. There's it's four squares. I'll find it. Yeah. There. I am. I just waved at myself. All right, cool. <laughs> nice. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, uh, thank you for the opportunity to get together with uh, just these men of God, Lord. Just that uh, we can inspire each other. Um, just that we can share knowledge with each other about what we've learned from this book, Lord. Just that uh, we can continue on this spiritual journey together. Uh, that we can spur each other on to uh, just um, just learn how to keep so true to the Scripture, Lord. And uh, not get wrapped up in the world, and uh, get pulled pulled out of church um, just with worldly views and worldly thoughts. And Lord, I just pray that we stay true to the Word and, and what You've taught us through the Bible. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, um, just that we can continue to build a, a strong foundation through the Scripture and. And uh, just not be pulled away, Lord, that we uh, listen to the Holy Spirit with decisions and that we continue to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, we can all learn from each other this evening and the future evenings to come. And uh, thank you so much for Zachary for putting this together every time. And thank you for all that participate. Um, yeah, I love all you guys. And God, thank you for putting all of them in my life. I pray this on your son's holy name. Great. Thanks for praying. Well, to uh, open up, I'd open up the same that we have with every other book club in the beginning. Like, in general, if there's any, what stood out to you or what was like, what did you underline or what was calling you that you were like, this is what I want to talk about? Yeah. 
so many highlights. <laughs> <laughs> like so many. Um, for me, it was um on the on the first chapter, first page. Um, it says um, a mass a media in which the West has forgotten its Christian past. That really like hit me in the gut. And in what way, though? Um. So, for instance, um, if we if we don't remember our Christian heritage, if we don't remember um our history from the first church, how are we going to be effective right now? How are we going to be the church that we're supposed to be if we don't remember our own history? And I think that's one of the big issues that's going on right now is because we don't remember our past. Yeah. Um, can I throw something in there? Go for it. So this is talking about the relevance of the church and... Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I went back in time to then, I would, I would be like, this is not relevant for me. So there are some things in there, yes, but as our culture changes and as we're in a different time, age, um, do, what, what do we do about that? Okay. Um, if I can rebut, then if going with that mindset, Papa Tucker, then it would be that uh, remembering the fundamental of what it means to have community, what it means to invest in each other, what it means to truly be there for that person and to disciple. I think in those points, it's still relevant today. Mm -hmm. And I'd say to both of your points and to draw on from the same page, you know, post-Christianity attempts to move beyond Christianity while feasting upon its fruit. In the sense that, you know, so much that is what is good in our beautiful world, as he describes later, is because of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I heard someone else say, like, you don't go from survival to fittest uh, kill someone with a club because they stole your fruit to Black Lives Matter. It just doesn't work without Christianity. Human rights are a Christian myth. Human rights are a Christian myth? Yeah. I mean, this, that, those, those, that was a, a quote from an atheist who said, you know, all these human rights, like, doing good for other people it's it's a christian mythos it's not like there's no basis for it in science or darwinism or survival of the fittest you know justice doesn't come from just our carnal beast nature justice comes from a something higher than us okay yeah I was surprised just to hear the term, or read the term post-Christianity, because to me, life has always revolved over, around Christ and reaching the lost, and just this thought that somebody or a culture could say, okay, we've experienced this, and we want to move past it, just blows me away. It was the first time I heard that, you know. Uh, yeah, I think, I don't know, off of what Jamie's saying is, I think... Um, often when I've used post-Christian, you know, we're in a post-Christian society, I often do talk about, like, I think about it in a, a very negative, not us situation. Um, like, we're in a world that hates Jesus, but um, I, I feel like, in the, uh, especially the first chapter, he talks a lot about even just that like, we, in a lot of ways, can operate in these ways, almost like we hate Jesus, and that we're more consumed about getting people in a door or checking some sort of box than really like showing Jesus to people. Um, and, and that we, to become relevant, we abandon you. We become the post-Christian, right? Within the church. And then we care more about relevance and inclusion and we care about really helping people see Jesus. Um, 
to me, I thought it was really convicting. I feel like I have lots of conversations about this all the time, you know, about, you know, how to help people get in the door or how to help, you know, how to help the young generation or whatever it is. But, um, I thought it was really convicting. Like, man, like, I feel like I'm sure we're going to talk about more of it. How do I not, the goal is not how do we get more people in the door to get, come to our church, but how do we, you know, show Jesus? I feel like that's what I saw a lot. And, you know, I underlined most of the first chapter. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I don't want anything in the second, but yeah. I, uh, I'll jump off of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I tend to maybe, I don't know. I read some of his, at least the first chapter, and I don't maybe, it seems like he was going for dread, maybe, is kind of what it seems like he's going for. Um, I don't feel that way, though. I, mm-hmm. um, I think the idea of a society being Christian in itself, um, like, kind of takes away from like some of the actual fellowship and, and the things that, like, for instance, I feel like things that maybe were accepted <laughs> as gospel are starting to be questioned. And as they're mm-hmm. questioned, it's revealed that, in fact, these weren't gospel. These are cultural norms that we've put into gospel. And it, and so doing, like, we're actually getting more to the heart of what Jesus was talking about first. I think, um, I don't know. I, mean, I think if this dude was writing during the Roman rule, I'm sure he would have had a lot of feelings about post, you know, whatever, post, uh, post Romana or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Like, there was a lot of stuff going on then, too. So I think the idea that, like, our society is shifting and that's somehow a bad thing. I don't know. It, sometimes it plays off to me. Like I, I don't, I don't fear that. I, I kind of embrace mm-hmm. it. I think it opens up. Um, I mean, I think I was saying to Zachary about this oh, a couple weeks ago, but I have more. I have more things at my disposal now to better understand the Bible than I've ever. Mm-hmm. And that's in the last five years, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just like really great resources that are from different people who aren't just white, uh, middle class men writing about things, uh, you know, by cultural men, um, mm-hmm. giving Eastern perspectives, things that I didn't hear for a very, very long time. So, yeah, I don't know if I got the gloom part that he was going for because a lot of this stuff seemed mildly positive to me because it, it kind of. You know, I think when people are caused the question, that's when change happens. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's, in like, in, in like page 22, he talks about like when churches go that way, right? When we fight for that. And he said, you know, I uh, was really cool. He said, the church that retained cultural transcendent elements and maintained orthodoxy grew in those who abandoned the central elements of Christian theology to find at spectacular rates. Which I, I feel like it's encouraging. Like, oh, like it's not about finding this new, you know, way to relate but it's how do we get back to jesus how do we get back to it and if we do we'll grow and if we do people will be attracted to jesus so i, I agree and i think it's it is encouraging right like there's a simple to some extent there's a simple answer like and and that uh you know that it isn't just assumed that we're yeah. in just that you know <laughs> oh everyone's christian and we all believe the same thing for sure. It kind of, what Nate said, it kind of takes away from the followership or the discipleship. I read something else today from a different book um, that went right along with it. And it says, you cannot change character or behavior and leave beliefs intact. It is one of the major illusions of Western culture deriving a form of Christianity that is merely cultural that you can do this. We can work, we cannot work around that illusion. We must dispel it. <laughs> And I think that's where the good news that maybe Nate's getting or I'm getting, it's like, oh, well, we can, it's, it's our role to uh, dispel the, the false teachings of, you know, cultural Christianity yeah. and encourage people into like, oh, God really is 
loving, and you can see that through his son. Mm -hmm. So if you guys, if you're on page, could you guys turn to page 17? I wanted to talk about uh, the, the new powers. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the flips. Mm -hmm. And I thought that those new powers could be some discussion as far as like how how do those infiltrate uh, our church or even just your own mindset and what would be the like and what would be God's standard like in response to all of those I think of all of them, number six kind of like struck me uh, by a large scale structure. <laughs> you said that? <laughs> I didn't hear a word you said, Mike. I know. <laughs> You're, uh, when you were moving around, I couldn't hear anything either. Um, for number six, uh, uh, large scale structures and institutions are suspicious and evil towers. Just makes me scared of like large scale churches and things. Um, yeah, I mean, like our church is what, 350 people, something like that. Um, but I prefer like a smaller community that I can connect more with people. Because the larger scale churches that we like in Austin or you have to get lost in the world and just kind of be your Sunday goer church church person. So you, you're saying, Michael, that you feel like a lot of people feel that way? That you know, they want it to be smaller, more intimate. Uh, it, I don't know. That's a, yeah. What? Yeah, Mike, could you repeat yourself? Oh. Um, there was some feedback. Oh, gotcha. Um, I'm just saying that's more of like a personal feeling. Like the larger the church, the more you can get lost in it, or the, the less connection you'll have. Um, so it's. Like when it says it's suspicious at best and people are worst, I think it can work against itself having such a large congregation. You know, um, but just to add in there, like even despite the, the larger congregation, we're also seeing it in the small churches. So, you know, there's a component that's present in both atmospheres. I think dealing with that component would be one of the things that we would have to think about and address, narrowing it down, you know, so to speak. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, people can definitely get uh, wary of institutions, but forget that institutions and structures are often made up of groups of people. And it's you, people's suspicion is usually because they've been hurt or they've had some sort of issue that stems from it. It's not just an inherent thing. Um, to, to steal someone else's quote, you know, church at times may be in, in the way of God, but it is always the way to God. Or it never ceases to be, to be the way to God. In other words, like, yeah, sometimes people within a fellowship hurt people because hurting people hurt people. But yeah. giving up or, you know, picking things with a twist of Christianity or how he goes on and says, like, people think that they're part of the fabric of the church and the good attendance is showing up once every six weeks. Yeah, I remember that. And then they slowly just. So, what about any of the other ones? Um, sorry, my daughter just ran up. But uh, I, I was thinking about the second one. Um, I had to get to it again. Uh, you know, traditions, religions, 
received wisdom, regulation, social ties, restrict individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression must be restrained, deconstructed, or destroyed. I think when I was reading that, like I thought a lot about just even relationships. And a lot of times I, I hear like, you know, I want things to be organic. Like I want church to be organic or relationships to be organic or even my small, like I want it to, 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 uh, to work, you know, organically. And, and if there's any form of structure or like, Hey, we're going to help you be friends. We're going to help, you know, we're going to create this structure to, to engage more. Um, I feel like at least my, you know, my peers were very, you know, we hate that, you know, just the thought of, you know, forcing and trying to force anything. Um, and what's funny is I feel like it causes us to have really bad friendships. <laughs> I feel like we're, we're generally not great at friendships and feel lonely a lot because we we resist anything that's inorganic, you know, or that's you know set up or you know so or structured. That's what I thought about when I thought about too. Or we're like waiting for another option to commit mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's- like, yeah, I'll let you know if we can hang out Friday. And then you never get back to someone. Because mm-hmm. yep. we're waiting for the what if and then just end up watch, you know, binge watching Netflix. Mm-hmm. So that's basically what I highlighted about you know, we can no longer see beyond ourselves to learn from history or be concerned about the future. And the result is an amnesia about everything except the immediate, the instant, the now and the me. So people are more concerned about their own feelings than other people's feelings. Yeah. What page is that, Mike? It's the next page at the bottom. What page number, though? 18. 18? Oh, yeah, you're on. Okay. Um... What do you guys think about number seven? You know, forms of external authority are rejected and personal authenticity is lauded. Mm-hmm. You know, how do, how do you see culture going that way? And where do you see yourself being tripped up by that? Could you repeat the question? What is it? So it's the number seven on these new powers. Forms of external authority are rejected and personal authenticity is lauded. And I think it goes hand in hand with number one. The highest good is individual freedom, happiness, and self-determination. I don't know. Reminds me of... uh... The end of judges in those days, everyone did as he saw fit. Here is first in the Bible, right there. Mm. Uh, I think it appeals to or goes with how Lynn was talking about um, what happened at the Grammys that shouldn't have happened. Like, no one spoke up, no one said that what happened at the Grammys was that song was was not okay and I mean we were more we rejecting what is right good and true if you're rejecting what is right good and true then you're direct, you're you're rejecting the external authority that is Lord of all mm-hmm. um, and then you are seeing fit okay well this is okay. Society said this is okay, so then it's okay with me. You know, yeah. and that's not how it works. <laughs> but that's what we're, that's what we're seeing. Yes, and if you uh, disagree with anyone's um, choices, you are fervently condemned for you know being X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. Because it's. You know, the concept of morality is changing to, you know, what is it that I think is right? And even if you disagree with it, you need to agree with me because I think this is right. So I think the bigger question for us would be, like, how does that thought process infiltrate uh, 
not only the church, but our own lives with maybe regard to uh, sin. I think, you know, with the first part of your question, right, the church, um, uh, in the 90s and the 80s, you know, leaders were expected to be obeyed, you know, at kind of at all costs. And I think we've kind of flung to the other side in a lot of ways where uh, we're quick to throw our leaders under the bus or, or you know, you know, we, you know, as disciples are like, no, like there are leaders, but then if something goes wrong or I hear a lot, people go, I don't really like the way that, you know, so-and-so does this, or I don't like, you know, we have all these criticisms we have of people that lead us. Um, you know, I think, um, and I, I know I do that. <laughs> like I know in my pride, I, I, I can't, you know, I can think, Oh, you know, I think this should be this way or, you know, which someone would lead this way and quick to kind of tear down those that, that lead me. Um, and I think definitely, I feel like in our churches, we're very quick to do that. We're very quick to tear down those that we disagree with if they're in a leadership position. Um, Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to be uh, throwing rocks from the outside than it mm-hmm. is to be subversive and uh, do things for a common good of change. Mm-hmm. I think, I don't know, one example I was thinking of is, is the stuff that's going on with Portland. It's amazing how many people who don't live in Portland, who've never lived in Portland, don't know any of the people have all these opinions and know who who's right and who's wrong it's like because we read a letter you know like oh i read you know 500 pages of an issue that's been going on for you know seven eight years I, obviously i know better than you know these elders and these church leaders and i think i don't know i was thinking you know, just, you know that's definitely a example of what we're talking about right that we distrust leadership and yeah. You know, we, we know what we're doing. Yeah. And if you guys don't know about that situation, then you're, you're in a better position. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's enough at home and right in front of us to focus on. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Uh, there was a lot to unpack in these two chapters. <laughs> I'm like, I highlighted a lot, but I don't even know where to go first or mm-hmm. going on what we're talking about. Um, well, if you guys want to turn over to page 23, one of the things I highlighted was down there near the bottom. It says, sin, in other words, as appears as a social fact, and the redeemed personality becomes confident about its own salvation, being aware of that fact, by knowing about and rejecting the evil darkened society. Like, it's like, you don't have to do anything about your own personal evil because you've recognized that evil is out there, and because you're aware that evil exists and you don't like it, you're, you know, you're okay. I highlighted the sentence immediately after that, so I thought that's where you were Yeah, so did I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The enlightened attitude. Yeah, yeah. The enlightened attitude. But that, you know, in saying so much in that sentence, it, you can, in my opinion, you can clearly see the minus of Christ in that sentence. Hmm. Because... Well, I mean, it's using your favorite word, uh, Zachary, white knuckling it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, how, um, how do you guys see yourselves or the church being encultured by that? And to me, the biggest way is, at least on a, on a more personal level, is how one justifies or, or, talk, or uses language about sin. Mm. I mean, I talked to I talk to uh, Mike and Force about this all the time. I'm like, you fell into temptation. Like, there was just a hole that opened up, and you fell into it. 
as if like, oh, well, that is sin, and because I know it's sin, I don't really need to change. I just need to keep acknowledge, like seeing it as bad. Yeah. Or as Zachary really puts it, call it what it is, evil. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know what else what do you guys think about that um, I mean for me um, I mean you pretty much said it for me Zach I mean in my mind I just keep hearing the phrase call it for what it is if it's a dog it's a dog <laughs> if it's sin it's sin you know um You know, it's just, for me, that this notion, this concept is a scary thought because I can't imagine my life without Christ. And it's hard for me to put myself into someone else's shoes who is willing to put a minus of Christ in your life. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if there's entire, like... I feel like it's entire or relates in my head, but um, I remember I was living with my friend Tom when I got reached out to uh, when I started going to church and got baptized, and you know started living like a, a pure lifestyle. Um, just like if I drink, it was not to get drunk; it was just to have a drink or whatever. Um, it, just watching the way I walk and. Uh, with my actions and stuff, and, and, like, he grew up Catholic like I did, and, and uh, we we're good people or whatever, but he's like, did you, know, did you feel like you were sinning a lot? Then, like, what, why why are you going to this church now? Like, did you feel like you were sinning too much or something? And I was like, no, but I do want a relationship with God. Like, I do want a stronger relationship with God where I am redeemed from my sin, and I can get accountability for my sin. Because <laughs> um, I, I never, like, considered that before, like, having accountability for, like, and what that can do for my walk with God. Yeah. I, I think it, it can be easy to... Uh, be like, yeah, you know, I've, I, at this point in my life, I, you know, I've read my Bible, you know, tens of times, and you know, uh, I, got, I know my Bible, I've studied it. Like, that's almost like I can rely on that and justify myself through that. Um, almost like it isn't as big a deal because of what I know, and I can just I can do the mental gymnastics and you know, the logical gymnastics to work it out. Um, where don't really have to deal with certain things. Uh, I can kind of lean on my being a Christian long enough, you know, or knowing the right, you know, knowing enough about the Bible to just lean on that. Uh, I think that that can be easy to do. Like, I've been around long enough, so you know, almost like there's a, like an, the intellect is past the love of wanting to be like Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, I think that uh, I'd say that goes hand in hand with his history lesson on the Pelagians. Pelagians, yeah, I don't know how to say it. you know that uh, saw themselves as that moral force trying to get everyone, church out, inside, outside, toward moral improvement, but it wasn't necessarily with uh, the best of heart, and it disregarded grace. Mm. You know. Uh, it, the whole, as, as he put it, the rejection of the original sin, you know, and uh, I, we don't need to get into a debate on original sin here, but just the fact that man has fallen, I think we can agree on. Yeah. You know, we, we it's, yeah. New Testament says we all fall short. Um, Testament. But, uh, how like how it, how easy it is to again view evil as out there mm-hmm. yeah it's oh. out there and ambiguous so I, so I, you know we see it as this ambiguous thing 
out there, but not real and definite in our lives. So you're saying that we see it as ambiguous now because it's no longer we've we've minimized it or rationalized it or um, done something so that it becomes more or less of a of an issue in our life. It's it's I mean truth is no, truth is truth or is it not? And sin is sin, but we sometimes we can, I guess Eve did the same thing, huh? You know, um, is it really, really? Did God really say? And we we do that in our own heads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, just to piggyback off that, um, the the thing that came to my mind was that it's replacing true theology with a man-made per perversion of theology. What? I said yeah, it's, a lot, it's, a lot of it's uh it's replacing true theology with a man-made perversion of theology. For example, like you said, how did God really say like God said this? But why are you trying to pervert it into did God really say? I mean, that's the same as what um the polygonism or the polygonists are doing in that sense, you know. They're just trying to put a new twist on what's true. And that's why it's attracting other people because, oh, I like this because they pick and choose what they prefer. If that makes sense at all. Yeah, I mean, somewhat. Uh, I think one of the things that it that stood out is how when it's talking about both the left and the right because we live in a political world now and politics mm -hmm. have become more and more of a religion uh but both have abandoned any standard of uh, morality when it comes to sexuality he talks about that mm -hmm. like hey here on my side i may you know I, I'm a, uh, you know, one side doesn't like illegal immigrants and another side is afraid of gay wedding cakes, but we can both agree that don't ask me about what I'm doing on a Friday night uh, with who I'm doing it with. Yeah. Just ask me the gender. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Or if you're on the other, you know, on one side, don't ask the gender because there's, you know, ask ask them their gender or what they prefer. <laughs> yeah, we we digress, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I and that ties in, you know, directly with those new powers that all of those those powers of like individuality and pursuit of happiness and self improvement and. Uh, resisting authority it's all comes down to do we really want discipleship and to submit our wills to God yeah. and if we don't do that I mean everyone can agree that well you do you mm -hmm. I think the real question is how do we combat combat or how do we provide something that is better than the you do you mentality that's out there yeah. Especially when the you do you, the you know, is well, you you know, you need, still need to be a good person. Yeah, all that kind of reminded me of page twenty-seven. Highlighted the post-Christian revolution by removing God from the throne in preference of the self. Um, and there's more to it, but like I just highlighted that. Because, yeah, we're more worried about how we look at what is good and evil rather than what God considers good and evil. And we're deciding that. Yes. Back to the comment on uh, judges and everyone did as they saw fit. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, or, yeah. or what was right in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. And then, just to piggyback off that with. Um, 
This dislocation was driven by the rupturing of their relationship with God, a rupturing caused by human rebellion and pride. Mm. You know, I mean, if we're thinking about what we just spoke about, I mean, it's basically rebellion and pride. If everybody saw fit to do what they thought was right for them, then in the face of it, that's rebellion and pride right there. Mm -hmm. Thinking they know better, and oh, hey, yeah, you're a guy, but not me, I'm gonna do whatever I want. Yeah, that, that's dangerous thinking. Yeah. One of the things in, the, I think it's 27, no, wait, 29, right? After what Michael said, he talks, he says, I think there's two things, right? He says, because it's, because the church is religious and yet denies its own sinfulness, you must blame the other, right? That's what we talked about. But then down below, he says, the, uh, the answer, I feel like, he says, we must regain, we must again rediscover the full internal nature of wrongdoing. I think a lot of times as, as Christians, I think it, in churches, we don't want to talk about sin because it's uncomfortable, because it might push people away. But when we don't talk about sin, when we don't deal with that stuff, we we can't see the power of God is the power of God is, is God transforming lives and eradicating sin and, and bringing us into this eternal life. And so if we want people to, to come to, to meet Jesus, they need to, the power of God. Now, so I was thinking, I was like, the issue, right, is that we, we want the fruit of the power of God. But we don't want God's power in our life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want the kingdom without the king. Mm-hmm. You know, this goes along with what I'm thinking, Mike. Um, shoot, what was it? It's, geez, and it was really good, too. Uh, something Zachary would probably say. But, uh, probably. <laughs> so, uh, come back to me. I remember it. Come back to me. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think that's all very good when you aren't uh, calling things what they are. I, I, Kendall, when you were talking, I was just thinking about, you know, not addressing sin uh, for people who are tr or who want Christianity. Like, could you, I mean, could you imagine not addressing some issue between like you and your best friend or you and your wife? And you're just like, you know, let's just not talk about that. Like how, how's that going to, what's that going to do to the relationship? Sits up there for There's always but people do okay. that all the time, though. <laughs> so I can answer that now. If we're not talking about sin, then we're saying sin is okay mm -hmm. because we're not mm. addressing it. As yeah. Zachary said, call it for what it is. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, if we're not condoning it, then we're not saying, hey, this is wrong what you're doing. Um, you need to talk about some, talk with someone, let course correct. But since we're not mm -hmm. talking about it, it's like saying, oh, yeah, I keep doing what you're doing. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's like, for example, I live like maybe 15, 20 minutes away from a strip club. Zachary finds out. Zachary doesn't say anything about me going to the strip club. And in essence, as one of my D group brothers, he'd be saying, Oh, yes, yeah, okay, keep doing what you're doing. But if he comes up to me and goes, Forrest, I saw you drive to the strip club because I was behind you going to another business for work, and you need to fix the attitude that you have right now because you are doing what is evil. Yeah. You know. And then where does it fall on us, uh, you know, reaching out to the world? Uh, and and finding that balance, and we'll we're I think transitioning into chapter two and then wrapping up because it's a relatively short chapter. But that balance of showing love in the Christ-like way, but not but not at the expense of our own orthodoxy and teaching. Mm. I really feel that the last two paragraphs of the first chapter were you know beautifully written. Mm -hmm. um, especially what is it? the Christian revolution demanded the death of a king, but not the king that sat in the palace, rather demanded the death of kings and queens who ate the fruit in the garden. I'll, us. 
However, at the height of the revolution, the only good king, the only monarch who ruled with justice and righteousness, who did not deserve to be toppled, allowed himself to be executed so that we, with all our pretenses of royalty, because none of us uh, have delusions of grandeur, would not have to die for our unjust rule. The cross held both love and justice together. The gift of grace caused humans to fall at the foot of the cross, understanding that they were sinful, only to be picked up into the loving arms of Christ and find that they were children of God. Mm. Yeah, there's a communion message. <laughs> <laughs> Just get up there and read that. Yeah. Um, I think how we can do this is by saying, you know, reassuring the person, hey, um, I care about you. Um, I don't want anything to happen to you because I love you and I genuinely want to invest in you. So let's talk. I'm not going to judge you. Um, I'm not going to spread rumors about you. I just want us to have a genuine relationship and talk. And I want to know what's on your mind and on your heart and what's going on because there's a root to this issue of your sin and it is fixable yeah yeah it's redeemable yeah I think when we don't talk about sin uh, uh, we don't trust that God put people in our lives that about us and want to help us and we don't trust God's grace uh, we're basically like putting up walls against that and saying it doesn't exist and I think at the same time, we need to be an example of grace because maybe for for some people, they've never seen grace, real grace. You know, grace without strings attached. Because, yeah. I, I mean, if we look at the world right now, there's always a certain kind of grace that has strings attached. But, I mean, when we have true grace where there's no strings attached, I think that hits home more to them. I mean, I, could, I mean you know, that's, that's my thought on that. Well, and it's it's at that point that, you know, grace makes you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And coming face to face with that discomfort really is the last step in relinquishing your own pride. Mm -hmm. I mean, the natural response mm -hmm. of loving Jesus is to obey him. It's not you obey him to love him, although that is part of it. But because you love him, you obey him. Mm hmm. And it seems paradoxical to us, but we even, you know, going back to those new powers, it, you know, highest good is individual freedom. No, according to scripture, the highest good is submitting your will to Christ because we believe that his manifestation of a, a God outside of time and space really does have in store what is best for us, even when we don't understand it. Any other thoughts on the first chapter? So what did you guys think about, uh, you know, the history of uh, Relevant? I, I, I mean, for me, I think it's good to know where we come from. Not just us, but like kind of the church in the West. And uh, what we're doing and, and how... We kind of do these things, but we can sacrifice. Like it's it's more important to have like church at a bar to make sure that we have people coming in. But then, I guess I guess the question is, what did you guys think about these atheist churches? I felt like. Would you say, it, Patrick? He <laughs> well, he kind of weighed his question there. Um, he said atheist <laughs> churches. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's like, wait, wait, wait. It took me a second. He said, okay, uh, atheist congregation <laughs> fellowships? I don't know. Uh, no, for me, I just, have, I just have three words. Distraction and noise. Hmm. What? Uh, I just have three words for that. Distraction and noise. Um, because if we... I mean, if we read into it, I mean, there's nothing um, of substance that they provide. 
you know, so it's just people going to these type of churches to fill a void that can't be filled in that atmosphere. So it's just distraction and noise. It's like turning on your TV and getting static, but you think you're watching something, but you're really not. You think you're going through an experience. You are, but it's not a fruitful experience. Yeah. Dad, what do you think? Uh, I know you have some good friends that have been part of the Ethical Society for decades. Uh-huh. Um, wh- and what's your question? Well, I, I guess I'm... Would, would you be able to shed any light on to, like, why are people drawn to something like ethical society or an atheist church, but not Christianity, especially in the realm of relevance. Realm of relevance. Well, I can't speak universally. I can only speak anecdotally for that particular couple. Well, yeah. They grew up Catholic. um, And it, for whatever reason, it didn't suit them. And they saw holes in it, and they chose other things. I actually tried to study the Bible with them and reached out to them. Unfortunately, it didn't. It didn't get very far. Um, we're still great friends, and they're great people. We love them. They 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 are ethical, and you know I can't point to them and go, oh yeah, we'll look at the result of their life because they have a good life. They're they're good people. They do a lot of good works. Um, they, their kids have grown up and are now in society and are doing well. Um, they have a good marriage. So I can't point to them and say, wow, they're just a mess because they didn't have Christ in their life. But at the same time, I can point to myself and go, gosh, I would be a mess because if I didn't have Christ in my life. Um, I'm not really sure where I was going, and if, even if I answered your question, but I know that as for me and my house, um, we will follow. So I can't answer. <laughs> there are decisions. Yeah. I can challenge him, have a good conversation <laughs> with him, and he's open to it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I just think it's interesting to have a more uh, first-hand account of an atheist churchgoer. Mm. Mm. When I was reading this, I thought about, one, I thought about, um, I had a friend who just came out and told everybody he was, he was atheist, and you know, was, um, he went from being a missionary, you know, leading a church in underground China, and now he's an atheist. And one of the things he said, he's like, I'm going to make it my life goal to help atheists live Oral communal lives, you know, kind of he's, he's starting his own atheist church, and um, and then so that was the first thing I thought. The second thing I thought of was my brother. My brother loves going to certain churches. My brother's an atheist, and but he loves going to make a church because he loves the songs. He loves the things they give him. Um, he and but he won't go to like he would never come to Gateway City because he's like people will talk to me too much. Like I don't want like people prodding into my life and. Um, but he loves the feeling he gets um, from the, the worship music, from the, the sermons, the, you know, or you know, like, and, and they don't they don't talk about Jesus or force you to do anything. But it's, it's uh, you know, they're good, you know, moral lessons that these churches. So, you know, I was thinking, I think about a lot of our, I think a lot of our churches are in denial about being atheist churches. But that's a side point. But. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, that's a good side point. It, it, and it's also that old adage of, uh, and it can be applied here, you know, why buy the cow when you can me- get the milk for free? Mm-hmm. When you can church shop and get the good feelings and have a sense of community that gets the dopamine response for a temporary amount of time with none of the commitment, well, why mm-hmm. commit? Mm-hmm. And if... Our life, your life, the church you go to looks the same as everyone else, then what are you doing different to draw people in? Mm -hmm. 
know, it's amazing when I was in Atlanta. I mean, there's just, I mean, I'm sure there are giant troops here, but in Atlanta, there's just some huge church, and they, their whole band are paid professional. Like, the church pays them to to play on Sundays and to produce music for, you know, for the Christian world. And, like, and they have, the, you know, millions and millions of dollars put into these concerts. I mean, they're concerts, right? And, and uh, you know, that it's interesting even as they are transitioning out of churches to call themselves local centers. Um, and the way the way that things are going, right, is we're, you know, how do we push out Jesus and, and insert what you said, Zach, dopamine, right? Like, how do we, you know, I mean, I, I think about reading books, I've read books on church leadership, you know, what color of lights do I need to have when we're singing songs? Or, you know, in the, in the 80s, you had orange, and now I think it's purple, um, that, like, to really get people to follow Jesus, right, you need purple lights during worship, and, you know, <laughs> uh, this, I mean, I, read that in, I think it's an X. <laughs> um, it's a chapter seven or something. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's where we where we're at, right? We've we've franchised out. We've you know found the business model of building churches without Jesus. Because mm. he's not enough. Yeah. You know, I, I have this part highlighted that social networking and other forms of pseudo community filled with filled the spaces where embodied community and institutions mm-hmm. once existed. Yep. And that goes hand in hand with these. Well, I can walk in, get a feeling, and walk out with no commitment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's easy for, it, and I think this is an especially relevant, uh, no pun intended there. Uh, discussion or book in after a, a year of everyone hiding behind a screen. Yeah. Hmm. There, I mean, there's almost no, well, I won't say almost no, but like the sense of community is different. Uh, I imagine I'm, I'm trying to imagine even at least for me, like if I was in this position, like Am I really good or have I just grown numb over the past year? Like, what did I feel six weeks into the pandemic? And has that just become my new normal Mm -hmm. of uh, not the sense of community? And now I've convinced myself that this is good? Or is like, am I, is this a pseudo community? Mm -hmm. And if so, what do I need to do different? Yeah. I'm actually asking that question to myself right now. <laughs> I mean, it's scary if we think about it, how many, you know, think of, who won't come back, you know, when this is over? Yeah. Because, you know, the 20 minute drive is now too much or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hope that people do not think that the future of church is online. You know, the internet is a great tool, but it is not uh, the answer. Yeah, no. Hmm. Have you have you seen TikTok Church? No. Yeah, there's, there's a TikTok Church. Mm-hmm. There's a guy, right? He calls it TikTok Church, and he has a, you know, I don't know how short it can be, but <laughs> you know, a 45 second lesson. Good for him. He's it's like my. Uh, in, Post-it note encouragement. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. And it goes in what we're talking about. Like it, uh, it, it's boiled down now to salvation comes from self-determination and improvement. Mm-hmm. And as long as you're, you know, on the grind, then you're good. It's interesting. Like Kendall was talking about, like how many people might not come back. Um, I don't know if it was only through my perspective, but I remember, like, back in spring last year, um, I feel like I was seeing a lot of baptisms, and I was hearing a lot of people, like, turning to God, because, like, what else are you going to do in a pandemic except, like, rely on God at this point, because you can't rely on people, because you don't see them. So a lot of people were turning to God, and then and then they got to this point where you're not meeting as a body, 
and you're not communing. So then they're like, then they get pulled away because they need that and they're not getting it. So then they start leaving. Um, and yeah, I feel like honestly in fall, I started seeing you know, like a few singles drop up the singles group, maybe that like I thought were pretty involved in the church before, but I'm like, oh, what happened to that person? What happened to that person? Like, mm-hmm. so, so yeah. How, yeah. <laughs> how do we provide that sense of community when we live in a culture that's hiding behind a screen? And back to the dopamine, you can feel like you're part of a community when you're arguing with with the other person, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with the out there evil. And then you got people coming to your side and you feel like, oh, yeah, these, these, these are my people. Mm-hmm. Like you can feel like you're part of a community without being any, anyone. Mm-hmm. So how do we as individuals here and then as a a larger church really provide that community, but also remind that that community comes with commitment to Christ and to each other. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Perfect. That's great. Well, does anyone have any other last minute thoughts or uh, a comment to my last, uh, I don't know, question to think about? Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I just thought it was cool how he was talking about the different, um, the different churches and uh, the ones that are trying to be too relevant and too, uh, too hip. Or like that. Um, and then like when he brings up the flash mob churches at the end, there, like churches that are able to harness social networking and energy to gather an impressive crowd, but who soon disappear. It just kind of reminds me that we must be doing something, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So. Yeah, those flash mob churches uh, remind me of uh, a certain parable of the sower. Yeah. And one of the seeds. Yeah. Or soils, rather. Mm-hmm. Jamie, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> Dan? <laughs> no, no, just listen. It's very good. Zachary, Dan reminds me a lot of Jordan Bondurant. Ah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> like, well, Victor flies up here, but doesn't always say a lot. <laughs> well, sometimes it is good just to sit and observe. Yeah, yeah. No harm. There's a group. Well, do you guys think that uh, the two chapters was... Uh, the right amount? I think so. Okay. Definitely wasn't so, too much. Say what? Definitely was not too much. Okay. And not too little. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see the next one. Well, I think um, we could do the next two chapters because that would finish out part one. And then um, probably do part two and over the course of two or, you know, split that up into reading three chapters at a time, maybe. So how does that work for everyone? Read the next two chapters and then we can reconvene in a week. But again, I would really ask you guys to think about my last little question out there it's not just a question to say hmm that's a really good thought but really for yourself for the and and then your part in the church how do we be that community when we have all of these pseudo communities but at the same time reminding everyone and ourselves that it requires commitment with a you know a basis of jesus but also commitment to each other And as, as always, if you have thoughts, 
throughout the week, you know, put them on the group me. It could encourage somebody. Yeah. So, uh, could someone pray to close us out? And that'll be that. I'll pray. Awesome. Father in heaven, we come before you right now giving thanks. We give you honor and glory for allowing so many things in which we can um, serve you. We thank you so much for this club, and we thank you so much for um, the opportunity to have this club through technology. We ask that you um, help us um, as we read this book together, as we discuss this book together, that your hand, your spirit continues to be upon us. And the club, well, please help us throughout the week, taking what we learned and bringing it out into the community to um, bring uh, others back to you, back to the church, Father. Uh, we pray all this in your Holy Son's name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you all for joining, and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Love you all. Remember, you guys are awesome. Bye-bye. See you. See you.